We have with us wonderful people. First, we have Dr. Kristen Bell, who is the Executive Director of the Exceptional Children's Department from Durham Public Schools. She's gonna speak first this evening, um, for, followed by Karen Lachlan, who is a wonderful parent educator with the Exceptional Children's Assistance Center. Um, and she works in the Southeastern Regional Office. Then we have Kim Tizar, who is the Director of Family Support for the Autism Society of North Carolina. Followed by her, we have two amazing panelists right here from Durham, Eliza Strickland and Samitris Porter. They are both um, part of the Durham Special Needs Advisory Council. Eliza is the outgoing co-chair and Samitris is the incoming chair. And then finally, from Durham County, our wonderful government, we have Jenna Meehan, who is the Special Needs Service Coordinator for Durham County Library. We're so pleased to have each and every one of them with us. Um, and with that, I am going to hand the microphone over to Dr. Bell. All right. Good evening, everyone. It's a, an honor to be a part of this panel. So it's nice to be with you tonight. Um, I think, are you guys going to do the screen share? Bring, okay. Um, first of all, for all the parents on this call, um, a, a big uh, extension of gratitude for all that you're doing during this pandemic. I know the challenges have been great. Um, I wouldn't even begin to pretend that I know everything that you're going through, but um, we know that it, there are challenges um, great and small every single day. So thank you for all that you're doing with, um, with your children and supporting their education. So I'm gonna spend some time tonight, um, just a little bit of time giving you some overview information about exceptional children resources and kind of what we're doing in Durham Public Schools around exceptional children services. Next slide. You can go to the next slide. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Well, I, I, I can, um, while the slide is coming up, I can, I can start. I know what some of those talking points are. Um, just one reminder for everyone is that Durham Public Schools remains in Plan C at this time, um, which means that that's remote learning for all students and um, even recent decisions um, that has been extended through this first semester, which will go into January. And uh, we know that our school board will be um, receiving some options and recommendations from the administration in the near future um, to make determinations about uh, plan, plan B options. So right now we're in plan C, that's remote learning for all students. We still get a lot of questions sometimes um, if that's uh, really for all students, if there are any, anything differently that we can do. And right now it has been um, the special education services for children and the related services have all been provided virtually. Um, so each child, each student should have a schedule, um, definitely at this point in time, um, and should have been in place for some time now of their classes or their courses, which would include um, when their special education and if they receive related services, when those occur throughout the week. Um, the IEP, IEP, the Individualized Educational Program for each child with a disability who is eligible and has an IEP should be implemented as written if that's appropriate and feasible in the remote learning environment. For many of our students, teams have many, uh, many teams have met now, IEP team meetings to review the IEP and determine that there are some unique needs in the remote learning environment that aren't necessarily reflected in the IEP. So that's where you've probably heard of the individualized virtual instruction plan. We call it the IVIP and that's unique to Durham. I think every district probably has a different name for it, a contingency plan, a learning plan. So we call it the IVIP. And the IVIP is meant to address what those unique needs might be. So that could include, because it's remote learning, a student may need some different accommodations. Um, they may need some of the accommodations that are in the IEP may not be appropriate in remote learning. Some of the services may need to be changed. Um, some of the goals and objectives may need to be changed. There may be different needs for assistive technology and things like that. So that's all reflected in the IVIP, which is the addendum to the IEP. So um, we know that some changes have happened over time since we've started school. And some of that includes um, like with elementary school schedules, trying to reduce screen time for students. Um, there's most recently a common lunch hour that has been established across the district. I believe it's 11.45 to 12.45, all schools. 
and um, the master school schedules have impacted EC services probably for some of your some of your children. As these things continue to change with the school schedule, our EC staff are working on how to fit in the EC services and work with parents to make sure students are still getting what they need. Next slide. So I did talk about this a little already. The IEP does not go away. It's still the IEP. It's the legal document. Um, there are many situations where it's being implemented as it's written because it can be even in the virtual environment, everything can remain the same. Um, there are students who have that individualized virtual instruction plan, the IVIP. Not every student has that because the IEP can be implemented as written. And remember, it's just an addendum to the IEP. So the, the thought is that when we go back in person, uh, if and when we go back in person, the IEP would go back to be the default document that can be implemented in person if a child has an IVIP. Next slide. There have been some questions too around um, how we've been handling um, new referrals and reevaluations. And we are, we are back on track. Uh, we had a lot of problem solving in the beginning of the year to figure out how to do this all um, virtually and if we could do some in person. So new referral meetings, that could be if a, if a parent or a school team believes that a child should be evaluated and may need special education. Um, we're accepting new referrals we have from day one of school, holding those meetings with parents virtually. Um, same with reevaluations. If a child has an IEP, is already eligible, every three years that reevaluation is due and could happen sooner as well. Um, we're meeting virtually in most situations with parents as an IEP team to determine what to do. Um, screenings, vision and hearing screenings, there's just certain components that have to happen in person. So those are scheduled on site. We've done a lot of work with our school teams to make sure those sites are safe, that our staff have the right personal protective equipment um, and that the student is safe coming onto the school campus if there is in-person testing needed. Um, we, we did a lot of planning around that. Um, so we do have options. We have some computer options. Our school psychologist, speech therapist, and occupational therapist can evaluate students virtually if it's appropriate for that child. Um, if not, or if there were components that need to be done in person, we will schedule at that school the child attends with the evaluators. We do know that some parents are still hesitant to have their child come into the school, and that's okay. We wanna do the best we can to let you know what we're doing to be safe. But at the end of the day, if a parent doesn't feel comfortable bringing your child in, you don't have to. So the evaluator is working directly with the parent to get those scheduled either online or coming into the school site. Next slide. Uh, assessments during, there've already been um, quite a few assessments. We have the beginning of the year assessments um, shortly after students began this new school year um, so there's all types of assessments that happen during the school year that will continue to happen. Um, formative assessments are those uh, assessments that teachers typically give. They're informal to find out how the student is learning and to help inform the teacher's practices. Do they need to do something different? Do they need to do some intervention, some remediation? Is, is, do they need to provide some enrichment? That happens daily, weekly. Um, so those things are all happening virtually, right? Because it's virtual instruction. Same thing with the district benchmarks um, and the universal screeners. Those at the beginning of the year have already occurred. You might've had your child take the iReady assessment or a reading plus at the secondary level. Um, so those will be beginning and middle and end of year. And then finally, the summative, these are the key assessments, there are others. The summative assessments of the end of grade and end of course, or course tests um, are still on schedule from the state of North Carolina. Um, at this point in time, they're still at the end of the year or the end of a course um, requiring school districts to administer those tests. And that comes from the State Department. So everything's virtual at this point. There may be options in the future when we get to EOG and EOC to do some on-site testing with those, but that's in, that's in the works. Next slide. So what guidance and support have we been given our EC staff? Um, uh, quite a bit. We have been engaged in consistent communication. Um, one of the blessings of having this remote venue is that we've been able to connect more frequently with our staff, uh, which has been great 
Whereas before we would always rely on having to physically get together. Now that we can connect without boundaries or borders, we have been having staff chats. Um, we've now established a monthly staff chat so that we can share information from our department and that our staff can give us feedback about what's working, what's not working, how can we support, what are you hearing from parents? What are the challenges? Um, we've done surveys with our staff um, and continue to do that around their remote learning needs, resources they need. Um, we've provided additional programs, supplies and materials with some COVID funding we've received. Um, and we're continuing to do that. Um, problem solving, access issues, that's a big one. Um, students and families that are having, still having difficulties or there's inconsistency with being able to connect with the technology or a problem with the device, language access issues, hotspots, um, trying to problem solve with our staff around those issues. Um, we've also been trying to convey a message of flexibility, flexibility and, and wellness for all. Um, just as this is stressful for our children, stressful for the staff and definitely for parents. Um, this is also new. So we've been trying to figure out how can we all support each other in working through as this continually fluctuates and changes, new information becomes available, new decisions. How do we work through this together and collaboratively? Um, progress monitoring, helping our teachers and staff figure out how do you collect data virtually so that we know how our kids are doing, right? Um, and there've been some challenges around that. Um, but we're constantly talking about that. Um, of course, empathy and care, being flexible with families and not being judgmental. Um, we're hoping that people are doing that. If there are difficulties connecting and scheduling and with technology or students not showing themselves on camera, that we've got to understand there's, a, there's, a, there's stories behind reasons why these things are happening. And we've got to proceed with um, trying to help problem solve. And then finally, working on plan B options, trying to figure out um, what our proposals would be as a district for return to school and doing that safely. So we've been having a lot of recent conversations around that. And I know, like I said, proposals, I think, are going uh, to the school board for the no one of the November meetings. Next slide. And that might be the last one. Oh, yeah, I think that's about guidance for parents. Um, we've got these, uh, and I you know Krista got them in collaboration with uh, Legal Aid and DECI and uh, RE Foundation and bunch of other great folks put together access guides for parents um, so you know who to call at the school. Um, that's the biggest guidance, I think, that I keep saying is know who your child's team is, like know the teacher, get their contact information, EC teacher, related service providers, if they have OT, PT, or speech, who all these people are and who to contact for what kind of issue and what kind of information and, and not stopping if you don't get an answer so that you've got a series of people that you can connect with because if you have questions, you should have answers to those questions and there are people out there to answer them. So just part of that's just knowing who do I contact? So we've been trying to be a part of clarifying that for, for families as well. I think that was my last slide. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank awesome. you. Thank you so very much. I want to make a quick much. announcement interpreting again, Krista. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Sure, go for it. And Así que bienvenidos otra vez a todos los que están aquí con nosotros, solamente para que sepan que tenemos servicios de interpretación en español, así que por favor escojan la opción de español, ahí en las opciones de Zoom para que puedan escuchar bien en español, y cuando estén conectados escuchando el español, pónganme un hola para saber que pudieron conectar bien. Gracias y que disfruten. Thanks, Angie. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Bell. That was super thoughtful and we are so lucky to have you in the role that you're in um, providing such empathetic and kind guidance um, to your team. So thank you so much, not just for tonight, but for every, every day. Um, we have another wonderful resource that I think families are going to really benefit from hearing about next. Um, our Exceptional Children's Assistance Center is such an awesome organization um, that benefits all of us here in this community. And tonight we are so pleased to have Karen Lachlan with us, who's gonna share a little bit about the resources. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you. And I'm gonna set a timer for myself for five minutes because I could talk about this all day. Um, as you see, uh, we're called ECAC and it stands for Exceptional Children's Assistance Center. Our mission is there. The most important word in the mission is, is the word parent. We were founded by parents in the 1980s, which wasn't that long after special education law first was passed. 
and we continue to be staffed by parents of kids with disabilities. And some of us have been around a little while and our kids are now young adults, but um, we, we have a staff a range of ages that cover a very wide range of disabilities through their personal experiences. And um, we are just existing in the special education world to help parents understand it, uh, navigate the systems, um, anything from uh, the, the system that our state runs for children under age three, uh, from birth to three, to working with the school system, to planning what happens after school, whether it's um, employment or more education or both, living as independently as possible. And we do that as parents, but also as people who take this all very seriously. We have a designation as North Carolina's Parent Training and Information Center that is a great honor um, to, that, that we take very seriously. As you see, um, we do have Spanish speaking materials and, excuse me, Spanish speaking staff and, and our print materials and things are available in Spanish. We're very um, proud of that and we're working on expanding language access to our website um, even more broadly. So if I could see the next slide, please. All right, so I mentioned the Parent Training and Information Center or the, the blue check, the Parent Training Center. That's our largest program. We have some other more specialized programs, whether it's by a type of disability, um, such as you see below there, um, or age group, which is near the red check. You know, we do um, work, work in specialized areas like that. We have some programs that kind of run behind the scenes, like the North Carolina State Improvement Project, where we're actually working with schools, school administrators, um, on things like, like getting families involved and increasing uh, quality of instruction for kids with disabilities. Our newest grant is really exciting too, um, the one you see called LENS. And that is looking at the intersection between learning and attention issues and uh, race and some of the uh, concepts in the world of special education that are that are um that are important and, and important to all of us to to be aware and learn how to how to do better so we have a wide range of programs and the last slide is probably the most important one here if you couldn't mind switching it krista it shows um how do we help what do we do how can you interact with us um and as it says to the left there, I, I like to really emphasize the part that we're here for parents, family members. It doesn't even necessarily have to be a parent. Also for educators and other professionals, people like Dr. Bell and some of the other um, educators in the Durham area are really want to hear from us. You know, how are the parents doing? What do the parents need? And they listen um, and they do care about the, the things that we're hearing because we're offering individual assistance as the flyer there shows, we're on the phone and emailing and sometimes both of those in the same day with tens of thousands of parents every year um, from all across the state, by the way. So if you have friends um, that don't live here, we are a statewide organization and um, we love to just problem solve with you. Um, I feel like we all, need a lot of empathy right now. We all need to share understanding and empathy with each other in this world right now. Um, we've always been good at that, but we're, we're, I think really can promise you that when you call us and then we'll, we'll, we'll go into some problem solving. Um, as Dr. Bell's presentation showed, there's a lot to know. And sometimes it's, it's a little overwhelming. Sometimes it has is a lot of vocabulary. Um, sometimes it has things that happen that are confusing or just emotionally laden. And so we wanna help you um, sort through all that and make an action plan so that you um, learn not only what you need to know, but what do you need to do and what's a really effective way to do it, um, to take those next steps. Often communicating with, with the right person in the right way is is the best the best thing and we can help you figure that all out um we do have um materials uh, to download the you know the, the good old-fashioned things that we would have used to mailed you are are all uh, downloadable now we have videos on there if you prefer that we have videos on dyslexia and the iep process uh, accommodations all kinds of things we're, we're making more videos 
will be available in the next few months. Um, and then uh, you can use that email address you see there just to fill out a quick contact form, for example, if you want somebody to, to, um, to talk with you. That's probably the best thing to do right now because we all are working remotely for a while yet and, and um, email's just been a very efficient way for you to reach us. And we also do group trainings and, you know, some, so I was actually in Durham for one a couple years ago that the, that the support group sponsored, but nowadays it would look like this. And we had a webinar just last night that was promoted through our Facebook page. And we had over 200 people attend that thing. So uh, the Zoom did not blow up. Everything was great. And there will be a second segment to that. So you see our social media icons, those are a great way, especially Facebook, to follow our group opportunities for learning and for support. From what I heard the, the webinar last night, the chat was amazing. People were really helping each other. Uh, they were answering each other's questions even to the side of the presentation. And, and as I said, we need the empathy and support that we can, we can all, uh, you know, help that go around. So that was a, a I, you don't necessarily think of an empath, a webinar as a supportive place, but it turned out it was. So, so we're looking forward to doing some more of those things. We are also focusing on some new things like youth leadership. We, if you want to follow us on Facebook, if you have a child who is uh, just really interested or good at something special, uh, they have a talent as they all do that they want to share that's going to be uh, available through our, our youth newsletter. And we have family leadership opportunities too. But at this point, I'm over, so I'm going to stop. Thank you so much for being here and for the opportunity to share. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, we are so lucky to have this organization in our community as well. And um, I re reference your materials all the time. They are awesome. Our parents know about them, and they're so great. So thank you so much. Um, we have another wonderful statewide president um, organization that we're going to hear from now, and I know a lot of parents um, with whom I work are looking forward to, to hearing this. Um, so we have Kim Tizard next. She's going to talk to us from the Autism Society of North Carolina, and let me just make sure you can see her slides. Is that good, Kim? Absolutely. Thank All right. You so much. Take it away. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's fun to follow you. Um... Karen, I actually was on that webinar yesterday. Oh, good. Fantastic, but the resources were amazing. Um, yeah. So I'm hoping those are gonna be available on your website too, so that others can, can see many of those. So I'm really, really pleased to be with you all um, tonight. I've been in this area for about seven years. And I remember when I first came here, um, I was lucky enough to attend an IEP meeting with a parent and got to meet Kristen and thought that she pretty much walked on water. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I'm excited uh, to be here, you know, with you all tonight. So I am the mother of a 24 year old who is on the spectrum and he is more impaired with his autism. So our journey has been, um, you know, a little tough at times. And I remember after dropping him off at his preschool when he was just, you know, four years old and just boo-hooing, walking out to the parking lot and being embraced by this group of moms that were standing out in the parking lot. And that was my first introduction to the Autism Society of North Carolina. It was a group of moms that uh, attended the chapter at that time. So we are a statewide organization like Krista mentioned, and we have been around. We would have celebrated our 50th anniversary. Um, and unfortunately, our conference um, had to be canceled as so many of our conferences and, and things had to be canceled. Um, but we're, you know, just, just pleased that we've been able to help support our community the way um, we've, we have been able to through this pandemic. Uh, we've been around, like I mentioned, for 50 years now, and we are a statewide organization. We work with folks that um, 
from birth, I hate to say all the way, some people like to say cradle to grave. I don't really like thinking about the other end of things, um, but we are here for the full life spectrum to help walk families through whatever it is that they need some help with. Um, next slide, please. So some of the things that the Autism Society does, and you know, we're just gonna touch on these briefly, and like Karen, I could go on and on all night and I won't, I should have checked my time before I started. Um, so we do pride ourselves on trying to help families improve lives. We do a lot around skill building and support. So some of those skill building um, activities can be we have a full clinical department where we do have um, services that parents can connect to, as well as all kinds of workshops and webinars. If you haven't been on our website, highly recommend that you do so. Our COVID page is incredibly robust right now. It has all kinds of social narratives. Um, we're working on more every day to continue to add to that. Um, currently working on some ideas for the holidays to give you all some suggestions because we know it's going to look very, very different mm -hmm. um, moving forward. So we like to work on that skill building and support. And we do have our, our clinical services. And right now, when you try to look at silver lining, um, what the pandemic has opened up is that we can now offer that rapid consult services through telehealth. So that may be a wonderful option for um, many of you that are listening, uh, that are trying to work through some of those learning challenges of even trying to use those virtual um, options that we are available to help you problem solve through some of that. Uh, we also do a lot with supporting families. We have right now 14 autism resource specialists across the state, all of which are parents of a loved one who is on the autism spectrum. We are autism specific. Um, so I know for some that may be listening, your child may not have autism, but if you even call our main number, we can still help connect you to one of the other local agencies too, that we can make sure we can get you connected. So the resource specialists also do those workshops. They're able to help with some of the IEP meetings or attending virtual meetings now. Sometimes um, just navigating services, trying to figure out what you're eligible for, for the man through our um, managed care organizations. We're there to help with that as well. And then we have this wonderful group of chapters and support groups that are also um, across the state and we can help connect you to that as well. Uh, very important to point out that we have Mariella Maldonado who is gonna be with you this evening and she had um, a family emergency come up. So, but she has a very active and wonderful uh, support group system as well. And is, she's there to help answer your questions and help you navigate. Um, the system as well, if you prefer speaking um, in Spanish, so that's fine. Krista, next slide. And this is a little bit more just about um, how we are educating communities. We have a full public policy um, department and we can connect you. And her name's actually Jen Mahan. And I think we keep getting some of our emails crossed. Um, Jen, I know that's happened in the past but we can connect you to, to our gen. Um, we have all kinds of awareness events and fun things, and we're trying to come up with some, some other ideas right now, especially for our chapters and support groups to connect people virtually, doing some fun games online, um, just a lot of different opportunities there. The workshops and webinars, are you can find all of that on our calendar, on our website. We have full translation services where we're able to help um, in that way as well. And anyone can make a referral to us. Um, next slide, please. The, there's just a list here of some of our other programs. I don't wanna to forget to mention our wonderful Camp Royal. They actually were able to keep going this summer, which was super mm -hmm. exciting. Um, very, very limited. Um, 
had to do all the social distancing and really, you know, it was a challenge, uh, but they were able to truly pull it off and it was a huge success for those that were able to attend. We have regional service offices across the state as well. We um, are able to provide innovations waiver services and other state funded services, and we can help connect you to that as well, as well as some adult programming, um, employment supports, our run walks. We did those virtually this year with a lot of fun. Um, just a lot of different things that we're trying to keep um, going to help everybody still feel as normal as we possibly can during these times. Next slide. So I wanted to point out on this slide, you'll see our main number. And if you press two or option two, you actually can reach our connection specialist. And she's able to help connect to whoever or whatever it is you want throughout our agency, um, including, you know, Mariella and, and to our chapters, to our resource specialists, to our clinical department. Um, so you can feel free to just call that one main number. You'll get a voice. She tries to answer it live or at least call back within a couple hours. Uh, so we're here to support you. And if we don't offer it, we can definitely help get you connected um, to who may be able to. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Kim. That is just really inspiring and very heartwarming to know that y'all are out there offering all that love and empathy. I can feel it through the, through the computer. Um, so thank you.